So Gallifrey One has been happening over the past week in Los Angeles and of course I did not attend for I am poor and unable to make international travel frequently in order to attend <laughs> Doc 2 conventions but thankfully there were some brilliant people on Twitter who have been documenting the event and also the, the panels and everything that's been coming out of it. Uh, let's just highlight some uh, a quick one now uh, at ScribbleScript on uh, Twitter uh, who was talking about the Joe Martin Gallifrey One interview. Uh, they've been a live lifelong Tom uh, Doctor Who fan with Tom Baker uh, she auditioned for the role without knowing that it was for a incarnation of the Doctor nearly lost the job because my agent was quite naughty I technically was not available for the dates of Doctor Who but my agent was so excited for Doctor Who she just said yes and hoped for the best Joe Martin lost her job working with Idris Elba in order to be the Doctor however the Doctor Who production team then stepped in to make it work and got her the old job back uh, I wanted to tell friends, strangers, enemies, ex-boyfriends. Uh, so, And she also apparently kept it from her family and her kids. So they didn't know that she was going to be the Doctor. They knew she was in Doctor Who, but they didn't know that she was going to be a new incarnation of the Doctor until it was revealed on screen. So that seemed like a, a fun day to be in the, in the Martin household. And talking about uh, the the costume as well, uh, Roy Holman, of course, getting some great shout outs and and uh, and uh, acclaim during the panels as well uh, for the incredible costume, the incredible outfit as well. Joe Martin, style icon, of course. So yeah, uh, we've got and also apparently she did all of the stunts as well. She did not have a stunt person. So when she's beaten up the Jadoon, not a stunt person. That's just Joe Martin kicking the hell out of a big chief rhino lady. They also teased, uh, Joe Martin and Matt Strones teased that she will be coming back. The story with the Fugitive Doctor is not yet over. So let's see what happens in Legend of the Sea Devils or the, or the Centenary. But one of the most interesting things that sort of blew up uh, in terms of like Doctor Who Twitter was some news and revelations regarding Thasmin. For those of you who don't know, Thasmin was a non-canonical ship... Uh, between the 13th Doctor and companion Yasmin Khan. I did a, uh, a live stream segment, a video, uh, talking to main protagonist, uh, talking to Ivy, uh, a Thasmin shipper who was uh, invested in the community and in that story arc. And Thasmin became a reality in Eve of the Daleks, where, at least in terms of Yasmin's part of, of the relationship, she opens up to Dan, uh, played by John Bishop, saying that she has feelings for the Doctor. So... There was some talk about whether or not this was planned, whether or not this is something that was uh, in the characters from the very beginning. And there was some stuff uh, with Matt Strevens at Gallifrey 1 talking about where the idea for Thasmin came about on str on screen. Uh, we've got Safik Yazi uh, on Twitter who uh, uh, screen grabbed this from Radio Free Scarrow talking about Matt Strevens talking about Thasmin. Let's have a quick listen. Jody sort of mentioning it after the first season, sort of think, did that, be, did that sort of like spark what, like maybe we should create yeah, a relationship? I think, I, I think she thought it was quite, you know, it's sort of funny that people had read that into it because there was a couple yeah. of just sort of screen grabs that had gone around that, you know, could be misinterpreted and that right. was all that stuff that's, you know, start something. And I think she thought it was, it was fun. And then we kind of forgot about it. And, um, and Chris doesn't, follow social media because again for obvious reasons yeah. um and uh yeah so I, th I think um it was something then that he wanted to bring in and just sort of play with it and i think the way that mandip did it and the way that jody's doctor reacts is is brilliant because it's you know um yaz is not sure what these feelings are that she's having yeah but they're fundamental feelings and um and i think it's a testament to john bishop who his performance in that kind of wheedling it out of them yeah um which i think was brilliantly done but um yeah there's more to come but i'm not i can't say anything no else. So there's more to come, apparently. So this is a plot arc or a character development which has not uh, run its course just yet. And I should really hope not. It's not something that I hope they, they bring up in Eve of the Daleks and then just drop it and never bring it up again. But there was a lot of talk during uh, Gallifrey 1, during the conventions, uh, and also uh, in addition to uh, what Matt Strevens has said there, that the idea came along because in Series 11, that was... You're right, Winnie. Uh, so the original plan, apparently, was that for Series 11... Yaz and uh, Ryan were going to be the ones who were teamed up, Mandip Gale and Toz and Cole. And they're sort of like the inklings of that sort of relationship uh, blossoming in Rosa, where there's that like flirtatious back and forth in, in the bathroom in the motel. 
and then he's never really got brought up again and apparently the plan was to sort of pair those two up however Jodie Whittaker saw how fans were taking the uh how fans were taking the subtext or screen caps or some out of context moments between 13 and Yaz and was shipping them together and thought that's actually a really nice and cool idea so she brought it to Chibnall and they decided that from series 12 onwards that's what they were going to develop and then it's during that uh, I think it really kind of really starts in the haunting of Validiadati when the subtext kind of becomes more the text culminating in what we've seen in Eve of the Daleks this past new year and I've seen a lot of people sort of like taking issue with the idea that this wasn't planned and it's like I, I don't really see what that in and of itself is as an issue in terms of it being planned like of course in like in an ideal world the the initial idea the initial creative process can run its course and then you stick with it you can you can disagree with like thasmin as a concept or you can think that the execution is lacking somebody in the chat earlier mentioning that they didn't really like how jody or like the 13th doctor seems quite dismissive of yaz i think this is mainly because it's an unrequited love maybe or there's more of it to play out we still have um two more specials to go between the 13th Doctor and Yaz, but conceptually, I don't really think there's an issue with this not being the original plan. Like, cr the creative process and media, like, not just TV, but film and comics and radio and audio and all the other formats in between, like, it it's a very multifaceted and long form process and just because something was planned just because the like you could like take the initial plan of Yaz and Ryan being a couple and by the time 13 zero is over maybe that wound up not being as interesting or as as like Thasmin could play out um he asks, says clownfish tv hates all of this clownfish tv hates everything I wouldn't really take much stock in what he has to say but when it comes to actually like planning it ahead like th the creative process is like a, is a very imperfect one Tony Parker says people talk plans just to sound smart I think in terms of like commentating and reacting to media like like you know I love JXE but Jason like put a, tw uh, a tweet out saying oh Thasmin wasn't planned like calling me shocked like that's the sentiment at least and like Jay I love you but like like the, that's not a criticism or like that that's not anything substantial like like for example donna noble was not originally planned to be the companion in series four and doctor 101 is like already there in the chat the original plan for series four was the companion to be a person named penny whose husband just cheated on her so plans change yeah that's absolutely the case i just because like let's say in this hypothetical scenario that penny did wind up being the companion in series four and like would that have been automatically better than what we got with donna noble and the dr donna just because it was planned like plans change all the time and when it comes to like the creative process as well i've seen people like not simultaneously because otherwise they'd notice the contradiction but also like i've seen them argue that no jodie whittaker and chris chibnall are not listening to fans whilst also saying that they're bad for listening to fans because they changed their plans to accommodate some of the fan tendencies like these are mutually exclusive things you, you can't compare them they're like magnets just like repelling each other instinctively just by their very nature either they're not listening to fans or they are listening to fans and that's bad like you can't really have them they can't really have them both jack alexander says midnight wasn't planned it was written over a weekend absolutely fires of pompeii uh was also I, I that i think that was like quite last minute as well i remember in the writer's tale there was original idea i think it was a world war ii set story uh, written by mark gatus and then they had to do pompeii afterwards instead uh, like so many plans like just because something is planned and then the plans change doesn't make mean that the changes are inherently bad or that the plan was inherently better than the alternative i think it's just a way of, tr of people trying to be like performative and also try and um have some sort of objectivity as a basis in like media analysis a, a, an incredibly subjective approach and subjective medium but they're trying to make it subjective a lot of it is posturing absolutely but like just because like obviously we still have two specials we don't know how thasmin is going to pan out but the fact that it wasn't planned from the beginning is not an inherent knock against it in fact, I think that it's kind of good that Chibnall and also Jody, who apparently was the instigating force behind this, were able to be malleable. Maybe realise that this direction wasn't really interesting, or wasn't really panning out, or the fans were really gravitating to this extra element. Doctor 101 says Boomtown is an example of last minute changes. I don't really know what the story behind Boomtown was, but, you know, the Rusty Davis era, they were all flying by the seat of their pants. For example, in Series 3, Blink was a last minute addition. 
Blink was not the original plan. The original plan for Series 3 was for Stephen Moffat to write a two-parter. That didn't work, so they got Helen Rayner to do the Daleks in Manhattan two-parter instead. Uh, and they did, um, Stephen Moffat did Blink as a way, as like an apology. That wasn't the original plan. But we wound up with Blink, and Blink is like one of the best stories of the era, and it won all of the awards and got all the acclaim. Blink wasn't planned. That doesn't mean that Blink is bad. And vice versa. Like, just because something was planned doesn't inherently make it good. Yeah, I think it's just a really super duper superficial. And I think a lot of the people saying it kind of know it. They just, they just need to perform the Chibnall bad, like, inherently. Yeah. Uh, and also, like, what uh, they also, like, the Fugitive Doctor apparently wasn't planned as well. Like, that I can partially believe, because they've not done anything with her since, she, since, like, the middle of series 12, with the exception of, like, a Once Upon Time cameo. Orlando says it really depends on where they take it, but it not being planned feels like they could be queer baiting. Po yeah, possibly. We, we we have to see how the story pans out, but I'm talking about just the pure principle of it. Just people saying, oh, it wasn't planned, therefore Chibnall bad. Nah, it's dumb. It's reductionist, and it's just really very, very shallow, shallow media analysis. Motorhawk Mission to the Unknown was unplanned. Yeah, loads of stuff in the classic series was unplanned because they were, they were flying by the seat of their pants. Um, obviously, in an ideal world, you have a plan and you stick to it. However, sometimes, like, things happen. Sometimes casting decisions get in the way. Logistics, budget. Maybe you planned to film in this great quarry, this great location. Oh, we can't get the permits or we can't afford it or we can't get the equipment there. So now we have to change the setting to a field elsewhere maybe that just because you change the plan doesn't make it inherently bad and when you are conceptualizing something of course it's going to change of course the plans are going to change because production is all about compromise and also when it comes to plans like the best laid plans and everything this was doing the rounds on twitter as well this is from the bbc writers room revolution of the daleks written by chris chibnall the new year's day special from the year just gone and what we've got is that Graham and Ryan have left the TARDIS. Uh, I was wrong. We do get aliens in Sheffield. He and Ryan leave. The Doctor doesn't move. Talks to herself. An inner monologue spilling out. Uh, I could always use the TARDIS to go back. Arrive here an hour after you guys did. Change the timeline. Then we'd have more time together. Yaz looks at her. She understands. It's okay to be sad. Jack comes crashing in through the doors. Breathless. On the Doctor and Yaz. Like the camera on the Doctor and Yaz. Cut to the peak district and then we have the ending with graham and ryan this original planet the ending of revolution of the daleks apparently has jack coming in through the door and people have been asking is it jack robertson or is it captain jack uh it's 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 captain jack because at the beginning of the scene you have captain jack harkness on the comms jack it's just uh, sc uh screenwriting formatting because jack has already been established in the scene as a character even though it is just voice uh, they don't need to re-establish him when he comes into the scene later on. So yeah, th this is Captain Jack just bursting through the TARDIS doors at the end, which, uh, firstly, that's quite interesting. We know that the decision to not have Jack be in flux doesn't really have anything to do with the public backlash to John Barrowman, because this was filmed and d this was done months, like... Uh, Revolution of the Daleks uh, had was like three or four months old before... All of that, like, that public backlash between John Barrowman. Although, you know, there were rumblings and people were talking about it beforehand and stuff. So, like, you know, that didn't really motivate the decision to, to cast him in the first place, of course, in Revolution of the Daleks. But, yeah, this was the original plan, apparently, for Jack to come crashing in through the TARDIS doors at the end of Revolution of the Daleks and maybe join Flux. I understand that the, what happens to Jack after this scene is up for debate and a speculation on my part, but... Would this have made the ending inherently better just because it was planned? Like, personally, this would have been a bit like a Doomsday, uh, where, like, you know, the, the Tenth Doctor is grieving for Rose, and then all of a sudden a bride turns up and it's like a funny thing. I don't like that ending. I think it kills the mood. And I really like this last scene between the the Thirteenth Doctor and the fam, and I think breaking that mood to have Jack come into T's Future Adventures, yeah, I think that's in the same vein. Just because it's the original plan doesn't mean that it works. For example, the Cybermen were, went, were meant to appear at the end of Journey's End to tease the next Doctor, but they cut it. But no, oh, they didn't plan to do the ending originally, therefore bad. It's dumb. But yeah, 
if this had been the broadcast ending, if Jack had, like, burst through the TARDIS door and undercut the dramatic moment, then, honestly, I would have been watching Revolution of the Daleks and I would have been angrier than Bolstrek whenever he sees a person of colour on screen. I would have just been seething in my seats because it just broke the mood. It just broke the atmosphere. But yeah, Doom Frost is Robot 77, the Doomsday ending is good. I think that having the bride kind of ruins the moment. Similar to, um... Last of the Time Lords. There's a reason they didn't do it at the end of Journey's End, okay? There's a reason they left him on his own, right? Uh, Alex L says, and that reason was Benjamin Cook. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. It's from the writer's tale where they were, like, talking about, should I should I undercut it? Should, should, I, should I have that ending? And, Be and Benjamin talks him out of it. Great decision on Ben's, on Ben's part. Uh, Flipsy says to Steel Man J, I think they, they feel like it's out of nowhere and that's why they made that comment. It's not even out of nowhere because they have slightly built up to it on Yaz's part at least. But like then the fact that it's not planned isn't the issue then. That's right, Winifred. That's right. But no, like once again, love Jay. I think it was just a shallow tweet. Doctor Who 101, the stuff with Yaz, Dan, and Jericho traveling around the world was not the plan. Oh, Matt Strevens at Gallifrey 1 apparently said that all of Series 13 was thrown out uh, and they had to do Flux from scratch. So there goes uh, there goes the theory that War of the Sontarans and Village of the Angels were holdovers from a previous series. Uh, apparently, all of Series 13 was just thrown out and they went and they started from scratch. Uh, with the with the the pandemic restrictions, uh, a Time Lord eight five two says, wasn't it confirmed that Legend was supposed to be the regeneration? Yeah, Legend of the Sea Devils, according to Matt Strevens, was meant to be the final story, the regeneration story for the Thirteenth Doctor, and then the BBC commissioned the centenary special, and now that's what we're getting, and that is the story where Jodie Whittaker is going to be uh, regenerating. That's honestly. It was something I kind of believed already because we knew about this Chinese pirates story. We didn't know about the Sea Devils, but we knew about the Chinese pirates story back in June or July of last year. And then it was in, what, September? No, it was like a month or two later they announced that Jody and Chibnall were stepping down and that the BBC had commissioned the centenary. So I kind of knew that the dates lined up, that the original plan... Sorry, Winnie's going mad. The, the original plan was for the Sea Devil story to be the regeneration, but I never quite wanted to believe it, because I think that having Chinese pirates and Sea Devils be the final 13th Doctor story is a bit different. I don't not bad. I don't think it's bad at all, but it's not something like if you if you were to ask, what's the final 13th Doctor story? Chinese pir Chinese pirates and the Sea Devils, or the master culminating all of the stories from series 12 and series 13 it would have been the the the, the latter absolutely but yeah it's just interesting um f so yeah scott jarrah says what does winnie think of the sea devils no, she fell asleep during it too long six parts no she can't have it no she can't she can't she can't abide winnie 